gives me great pleasure to officially open RISE 14 by introducing our keynote speaker, Sandra Pianalto, the President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. President Pianalto oversees 950 employees in Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh who conduct economic research and supervise financial institutions and provide payment services to commercial banks and the U.S. government. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sandra Pianalto. Thank you, David, for that very nice introduction. And um, I also want to thank David and the other organizers of this extraordinary event. Uh, this is my second time speaking at a RISE conference, and I'm delighted to be invited back. And this one is a little more special for me for two reasons. One is I now have a nephew who is a student here at the University of Dayton. Uh, JJ is a freshman and he's majoring in, engineer, uh, in engineering. And I got to spend some time with him last night getting to learn more about the campus. And obviously it's also exciting to be on a campus that has had a lot of excitement uh, over the past week. I know everyone's anxious uh, to watch uh, the, the game tonight. I told my nephew, JJ, that um, Dayton and the Flyers dashed the hopes of 99% of the individuals who entered the billion dollar bracket. Uh, so bravo, Dayton. And, and again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm anxious to watch the game tonight. I'm very impressed with the turnout here this morning at this unsocial hour uh, for many of the students. Um, my nephew JJ was playing soccer at midnight last night, so I'm very impressed with this turnout. I am so pleased to see so many uh, engaging and energized faces from students from so many universities across the country. So uh, thank you for being here so early this morning. Depending on how the game goes tonight, I'm not sure that this place is going to be filled so early tomorrow morning. but. But I know this is going to be a fascinating conference. I know it's going to be a terrific source of information for all of you that are here. And perhaps it's also going to be a source of inspiration for some of the students who are thinking about their future careers. My journey to a career with the Federal Reserve began actually when I was nine years old, believe it or not. My family moved to the United States from Italy when I was five years old. We moved to Akron, Ohio. And the reason my family moved to Italy, my parents brought us here, was so that we would have better opportunities, especially educational opportunities. And I was nine years old when I helped my parents study for their citizenship test. Kids learn English much faster uh, than the, their parents. And so in helping my parents learn and study for their citizenship test, I learned a lot about the U.S. government and how it operates. And I knew at that very early age that I wanted a career in public service. I started with the Federal Reserve right out of college. And three decades later, I've had a fascinating and rewarding career with the Federal Reserve. In my view, it's an extraordinary institution, and we're celebrating our 100th anniversary uh, this year. So today, in my comments, I want to highlight some of the changes that have occurred at the Federal Reserve in its first century of existence. And I'll begin by giving you a little bit of background about its origins, and then I'll focus on some of the recent changes we've made in monetary policy that were brought about through the financial crisis and economic uh, recession. And then I'll conclude by discussing the monetary policy actions that we've taken more recently. So since we're on a college campus, I think it's appropriate to begin with a brief history lesson. In October 1907, the U.S. economy was seized by panic. 
And yes, I did say 1907. And it began with the, fail the failure, or failure of the Knickerbocker Trust Company in New York City. The collapse of that institution was made all more sensational because the president of the trust company committed suicide one month later. Knickerbocker's demise set the stage for bank failures that spread across the United States. Depositors lined up for blocks to take out their funds from troubled banks. The stock market crashed and unemployment started to skyrocket. The prevailing emotion at that time was fear. And it was later said the nation had lost its confidence. It would take leadership and courage to restore it. Leadership and courage came years later, six years later, when on December 13th, uh, to, uh, December 23rd, 23rd, 1913, President Woodrow Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act, which created the Federal Reserve System. To this day, there's no other institution in the United States that's structured quite like the Federal Reserve. The structure of the Federal Reserve actually reflects the debate that led to its formation. Commercial banks wanted the Federal Reserve to be owned and operated by the banking system. Businesses and banks outside of New York City wanted to make sure that the Federal Reserve wasn't controlled by Wall Street. Meanwhile, there were many in Congress that wanted the Federal Reserve to be totally government. The resulting legislation ended up with a compromise. And it sounds contradictory, but the Federal Reserve is a decentralized central bank with both public and private components. To be more concrete, the Federal Reserve Act established the Federal Reserve Board in Washington. It's made up of seven individuals who are appointed by the President and go through the Senate approval process. And it also divided the country into regional districts, with Federal Reserve banks headquartered in each of them. The presidents of each of the 12 Federal Reserve banks are appointed by a board of directors made up of private citizens from our districts. Now, the Federal Reserve has a number of responsibilities. I'm going to be talking about monetary policy. That's the responsibility that gets a lot of attention. But we have other responsibilities that you may not be familiar with. For example, the Federal Reserve serves as lender of last resort. Federal Reserve banks can make loans to address financial panics. And we certainly made use of that lending during the financial crisis in 2008. We also supervise banks. We work to ensure an accessible, efficient, and reliable payment system in the U.S. We serve as the federal government's bank. And uh, we have community development programs that support economic growth for low and moderate incomes uh, neighborhoods across the country. But a lot has changed over the past 100 years of our existence. Clearly, as a woman, in 1913, I would not be heading a Federal Reserve Bank, nor would a woman be chair of the Federal Reserve System, as is now the case with Janet Yellen. So as an employer, the Federal Reserve has definitely adapted to reflect the nation's times and the nation's diversity. In addition, there are plenty of examples of how our responsibilities, the work that we do, has adapted to reflect the nation's challenges and needs and the nation's ambitions. Monetary policy is a prime example of the changes that have been made to reflect the challenges and needs of the country. To begin with, 
monetary policy didn't, as we know it today, didn't even exist in 1913. At that time, the U.S. was on a gold standard. There was no such thing as buying and selling Treasury securities to influence interest rates. But the gold standard proved to be in, too inflexible in times of stress like the Great Depression, and it was gradually abandoned. Ultimately, the country transitioned from a system of money backed by gold to a system of money that's backed by the confidence in the U.S. economy. And it wasn't really until the 1930s that the Federal Reserve began conducting monetary policy as we know it today. During that decade, Congress established the Federal Open Market Committee. That's the committee that sets monetary policy for our country. The committee is commonly known as the FOMC. And it consists of the seven governors of the Board of Governors in Washington and the 12 Reserve Bank presidents, although we rotate our vote on that committee. The Federal Reserve's objectives in setting monetary policy have changed over time. After World War II, lawmakers were concerned about the millions of soldiers that were returning to the United States and, that they were, and were concerned that they would not have jobs. In response to that concern, Congress passed the Employment Act of 1946, which called for all parts of government, including the Federal Reserve, to pursue maximum employment, production, and purchasing power. Then, in 1978, Congress gave the committee a more official mandate. At that time, the economy was reeling from high energy prices, rising unemployment, and rapidly increasing inflation. In response, Congress directed the Federal Reserve to, to promote maximum employment and stable prices. Today, we call those objectives our dual mandate, and you hear us talk about that dual mandate a lot. So you can see the Federal Reserve has adapted, and its responsibilities and objectives around monetary policy has changed over the past 100 years. However, some of the most significant changes we've made in the way we conduct monetary policy really occurred more recently in response to the financial crisis and the economic, deep economic recession and the slow ensuing recovery. Before the financial crisis and economic recession, the primary tool that the Federal Reserve used to conduct monetary policy was targeting the federal funds rate. By way of background, the federal funds rate is a short-term interest rate that banks charge each other for, uh, usually on an overnight basis, for funds. However, that federal funds rate influences many other interest rates. So when the federal funds rate goes down, car loans, mortgages, and even interest rates on credit cards can re be reduced. They get less expensive. And obviously, low interest rates have a positive impact on the economy. When consumers can borrow at lower interest rates, they can afford to buy more goods and services, the businesses who supply those goods and services have to hire more people to, to um, produce those goods and services. When more people are working, they have more money to spend. More spending creates more jobs. More jobs create more spending. So that's what happens when we bring interest rates down. The reverse happens when the federal funds rate um, increases. So that's why, for many years, Targeting the federal funds rate was a very effective way for the Federal Reserve to fulfill its objectives. But that ended in 2008, when the economy was teetering on the brink of another depression. We lowered that federal funds rate to effectively zero. 
He couldn't go any lower than that, yet the economy was still in, a, in the recession. So we had to turn to unconventional tools. The most well-known of these tools is what we call, in the Federal Reserve System, we call it large-scale asset purchase programs. In the press, it's been commonly known as quantitative easing or QE. The purpose of the asset purchase program is to put downward pressure on interest rates. And we accomplish this by purchasing longer-term treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. Now, this is in contrast in the way we push down or target the federal funds rate, because when we're targeting the federal funds rate, we're typically buying short-term treasury securities. In turn, the purchase of longer-term treasury securities pushes down the rates that consumers and businesses borrow at. Mortgage interest rates are a very good example of the kind of interest rates that get pushed down as we're buying these longer-term assets. So that's one unconventional tool that we've used, quantitative easing. The other major unconventional monetary policy tool that we've turned to is called our forward guidance. I know that term may sound strange, but really all it means is that we're giving the public more information on how monetary policy is likely to evolve. Increasingly, the effectiveness of monetary policy depends on how the public reacts to our policy action. This is especially true with our forward guidance tool. Banks are quick to understand that our forward guidance means that their cost of funds will remain low. But the policy effects are strongest when not only banks believe that our funds will remain low, their cost of funds will remain low, but also that the borrowers have confidence that short-term interest rates will stay low. Studies have shown that both of these unconventional tools, our large-scale asset purchase programs and our forward guidance, have helped to significantly lower longer-term interest rates just as we had intended. So the way we conduct monetary policy has changed significantly. And the way we communicate about policy has also changed. It was actually only 20 years ago that the Federal Reserve first communicated the policy action that was taken at our meetings following the meeting with, by issuing our first statement. Now, that statement was a very short statement, was only a few sentences. And on that first occasion, it was also thought that we may not keep issuing statements following our meeting. Compare that today to today. Now we release a statement following every meeting, and that average policy statement length is now up to about 900 words. Now our enhanced communications goes beyond just issuing a policy statement following our meetings. We ha have other enhancements to our communications. Uh, we, first of all, have set a numerical objective for inflation. It's 2 percent over the longer term. Uh, prior to that, I mentioned our mandate was price stability. But we've said to the Federal Reserve that means 2 percent inflation over the longer term. We've also started to release our projections for economic growth, for unemployment, for inflation and for our expectations of the federal funds rate on a quarterly basis. We released them just after our meeting uh, last week. And now the chair of the Federal Reserve holds press conferences following four of the FOMC's eight meetings each year. Janet Yellen held her first press conference uh, as uh, Federal Reserve chair just last week. Now, in a time when we are using unconventional tools, 
That's made monetary policy more complex. And when, when there are more complexities introduced into the process, uncertainty about monetary policy could have increased. But in my view, our enhanced communications have delivered greater clarity to the public and financial markets. We've come a long way from when former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan proudly said, if I turn out to be particularly clear, you've probably misunderstood what I said. So that's some background on how monetary policy works and why communications are so important. Now let me tie everything up by discussing the rationale for the Federal Open Market Committee's most recent decisions. To put it simply, even though we are making some progress, we are still falling short of achieving our objectives for maximum employment and 2% inflation. On the employment front, the economy has generated about 180,000 net jobs per month over the past year. That's a respectable number, and it is helping to reduce the unemployment rate. In fact, the unemployment rate has fallen from 8% when we started this third round of QE in September of 2012. It's fallen from that 8% to 6.7% uh, where it is today. And our current round of QE is aimed at supporting ongoing improvements in labor market conditions. So in light of the improving labor market, the committee decided last week to make another modest reduction in the pace of our asset purchases. This was our third consecutive reduction in the amount of purchases since December of last year. We have now trimmed our purchases to $55 billion of Treasury and mortgage-backed securities each month. But at 6.7 percent unemployment rate, that's still elevated. In addition, there are too many people who can only find part-time work, even though they'd rather be working full-time, and others have simply given up looking for work in this economy. And there are still a large number of people who've been unemployed for long durations, and that remains a significant concern. Turning to inflation, we're falling short of our 2 percent objective. The main gauge that the Federal Open Market Committee looks at, the PC um, in index, it, that's hovered around 1.1 percent over the past year. Now, low inflation might sound like good news, but today it's also a sign that the economy isn't uh, firing on all cylinders. And the big risk is that low inflation could tip into deflation. That's when the level of prices actually falls. When deflation happens, businesses and consumers put off spending and investment because they're waiting for even lower prices, and that's bad for the economy. So given the elevated unemployment rate and the persistently low inflation rate that we're seeing, monetary policy remains very accommodative. Now, even though we're scaling back on our asset purchases, we are still buying a sizable amount. At this point, we've accumulated about $4 trillion worth of securities, which is four times the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet just six years ago before the financial crisis and recession. So these sizable asset holdings should continue to maintain downward pressure on interest rates. The FOMC has also indicated that we intend to keep the target federal funds rate exceptionally low in order to continue to make progress 
on both maximum employment and inflation. The committee will take into account a wide range of information in determining how long to keep the federal funds rate target low. We'll be watching labor market conditions. We'll be watching indicators of inflation. And we'll be watching developments in financial markets. It's a complicated world out there, and no one single data point is going to determine the committee's next move. With appropriate monetary policy, I see this economy expanding at a slightly stronger rate this year than last. I expect GDP growth to be around 3%, and I expect the unemployment rate to fall to 6.2% by the end of this year. And I project that with our accommodative monetary policy, with a strengthening economy, and with stable inflation expectations, those will bring the inflation rate back to our 2% objective. But I expect the progress on inflation to be slow. So that's my outlook for the economy and a few comments about the current stance of monetary policy. To sum up my talk this morning, I've discussed some notable changes in the way the Federal Reserve conducts monetary policy. I hope that you have a better understanding of the Federal Reserve's action. And I hope that you can see that we are working to build an economy where many of you who are soon to be young professionals entering the workforce can follow your dreams and your passions. So um, on that note, before I end to take some of your questions, I wanted to give a few words of advice for those students who are in the audience today. Um, I mentioned I've had more than three decades of a career with the Federal Reserve System, and on June 1st of this year, I'm retiring from the Federal Reserve System. So when you get ready to retire, you become much more reflective about your career. So some advice I'd like to give uh, some of the students today. You know, I mentioned in my opening comments that I knew at a very young age that I had a passion for public service. So I urge the students in this audience to follow your passions and, and your dreams. And as you think about launching your careers, I urge you to worry less about your starting salary and worry and focus more on joining companies and, and starting careers in where you're going to find good people to work with, and where you, where you will learn more. Choose employers that are a good fit for you. Don't choose them because of the salary. And here's a free tip. Many of today's employers are hiring for people with the right attitude. Employers have come to learn that you can teach skills but you can't teach attitude. So make sure that you have a positive, can-do attitude, and you'll be surprised how much that counts in the workplace. Finally, push yourself outside your comfort zone. If you keep doing the things you're good at and that you're comfortable with, you're not going to grow. The only way you can grow and advance is to challenge yourself. Raise your hand for those difficult assignments. So work hard, stay upbeat, and success will follow. And I'm going to conclude my remarks uh, with a reading of just a, a couple of lines from an old poem that's called Success, because it, it definitely captures my definition of success. To laugh often and much. To win the respect of intelligent people. To find the best in others. To know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. 
this is to have succeeded. So I wish all of you great success in your careers and in your lives. And I am uh, thank you for your kind attention. I am looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Pinalto. Now we are going to take some questions from students in the audience. We are going to start with a question from the University of Dayton China Institute, a student in China. And we may not have audio. If students want to start. Here we go. Hello, Miss President. Hello, Miss President. Do you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, it's a great honor for to be here. And this is my question. Uh, my name is Yan Ming Wu. I'm studying finance in Jimmy University. Uh, recently, I have noticed that the competitive easy, the competitive easy monetary policy of America, I mean the QE policy, is pretty gradually. So uh, I just wonder whether it indicates that the, uh, the economic situation of America has a strong sign of a recovery. And would the seeds of this policy finally incur any problems in the future? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I got a thank you for the question and thank you for joining us today. It's very exciting that you were part of this conference. Now I got some, um, a few, it was a little bit challenging to hear you, but I hear that you're asking about our quantitative easing, the fact that we're scaling that program back and is that going to introduce any problems for our economy. So I think that's the gist of what I heard through your question. Now, the scaling back of our asset purchase program, uh, it reflects the fact that we are seeing improvements in our labor markets since the FOMC began uh, that program. And as, I, and as I mentioned in my comments, I do expect, I am forecasting, that the economic recovery is going to continue and, in fact, economic growth is going to pick up this year and that the unemployment rate will continue to fall. So we're definitely making progress. And an improving outlook should result and will eventually result in our ending the QE program, uh, result in the end of our asset purchases. But that said, uh, when asset purchases have ended, the committee is going to continue to provide appropriate policy accommodation. Um, we, we want to provide that accommodation, in my view, because I'm speaking for myself and not the committee, to ensure we want to provide the appropriate accommodation to ensure that the economic recovery is stronger and that it's also sustainable. So thank you very much. I hope that got to the, the, the question you were asking. So now we'll take questions from Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. From students in the audience at each of the microphones. You can go ahead and form lines at each of these microphones in this aisle and this aisle. Go ahead. Hello, uh, this is Jeff Navarro from Marymount University. Uh, my question is that earlier you mentioned that um, you guys have been looking at both conventional and non-conventional tools to stimulate in, uh, economic growth. Um, in the near future or in the future, what other non-conventional tools have you guys been looking at that can possibly drive a better effect on the economy? Well, we're, um, we're not looking at other unconventional tools. You know, in, again, um, in my view, the aim is to get the uh, recovery 
uh, back on a sustainable path so that we can go back to using our more traditional tools. And in fact, um, if uh, we, uh, we've had, you know, obviously uh, this, the past few years have evolved um, uh, sometimes not as we expected. And if you go back and look at uh, the minutes where back in 2010 we were talking about, uh, or actually 2011 when we were talking about our exit strategies, we, we made some statements about how we expect to go back to more normal tools once the recovery is sustainable. And so that might be a document that you want to go back and look at because that does talk about us going back to using our more traditional tools of, of targeting the federal funds rate. Definitely. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kyle Gardner from Christopher Newport University. And my question was, um, what are your plans or what do you think the Fed will do to unravel the balance sheet? As you said, it's grown massively over the past six years. And do you think we'll try and maintain those levels or kind of shrink it back down to a normal size? Well, ag again, um, that document that I talked about in terms of, you know, our exit strategy, uh, that will give you some guidance on how the committee uh, will uh, unwind its, its balance sheet. Currently, we are reinvesting the assets on our balance sheets that mature. And so, you know, a, a first step in unwinding would be to stop that reinvestment. And um, then again, and I'm not going to be part of the committee that actually um, finalizes the steps to a more normal balance sheet, but, uh, but there, there will be steps. Uh, those steps will be communicated, and I'm confident that even though, as I said, we have a very large balance sheet, historically large, um, that the committee will have the tools to unwind that balance sheet um, in a very effective way, one that does not cause disruption to markets or the economy. Thank you. I, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, if there were to be a scenario where there would be a financial crisis, even to the uh, near the magnitude of the previous one, do you think the Federal Reserve would have the ammunition, so to speak, or the resources to properly respond in a similar way that they did for the last recession? Uh, uh, yes, in fact, uh, that, uh, that's a, a good question. You know, I've spent a lot of time in my remarks today talking about the monetary response to the financial crisis and to the um, economic recession. But we've also made significant changes into the way we supervise the financial system. Uh, and so the reason I'm answering your question with that is that the changes that we made uh, will help to prevent future financial crises. So the changes that we've made are um, we look at the financial system, or that we were very good <laughs> pre-financial crisis at supervising individual banks. We learned through the process that supervising just individual banks and not looking across the banking system, macro prudential supervision, uh, was not sufficient. So now we look across the banking system. We also, uh, many of the, of the issues leading up to the financial crisis, came out of the shadow banking system, not the institutions that we supervised. So now, as a result of Dodd-Frank, um, many of the significant, um, the systemically important institutions that are not banks are also part of the supervisory process of the Fed. And then a th another step that we've taken, and it's gotten a lot of attention um, in the past week or so, um, and even today's, yesterday's news, are the stress tests. Through the financial crisis, one of the I mentioned in my history example of why the Fed got created, I mentioned the 1907 panic. Well, obviously, uh, the panic of 2008 um, also led the country to lose confidence in the banking system. One of the steps that was taken to restore confidence in the banking system was to conduct stress tests. Uh, to give the U.S. public, the world uh, financial markets, confidence that the banks had not sufficient capital to continue to operate and to lend. Those stress tests have now become a normal part of our 
uh, supervision of large financial institutions. And last week we announced uh, the, that 29 of the 30 companies that we conducted stress tests of had adequate capital. And then yesterday the various capital plans of the various companies were announced and, and, and we announced those that can move forward, or forward with their dividend plans. So all of these steps that we've taken in our supervisory supervision of financial institutions are taken to help prevent financial crises in the future. Hello, um, my name is Tyler Wake. I'm with Ohio Wesleyan University. Thanks for coming. Uh, I had a question. In your um, speech, you mentioned the low like velocity of money, how money is not really traveling through the economy because of inflation. And you also meant, and there's been criticism of the Fed that their QE is amounting to corporate welfare. So my question is, how does the Fed see the opportunity cost of its actions in quantitative easing? And is the bond buying reduction a sign of higher opportunity costs? Thank you. Thank you. Well, our, Q, our QE program, as I mentioned, is to put downward pressure on longer term interest rates so that borrowers and con uh, consumers and businesses could borrow at lower costs. That helps uh, economic growth, as I mentioned in my talk. Um, so we have seen benefits and we, to our lower interest rate environment in our programs. And, but as you point out, you also have to weigh the costs. And, and in this case, we're weighing potential costs because we do not see costs currently. But potential costs um, such as disruptions in financial markets with us buying such large numbers of U.S. Treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. So we're, we're weighing those financial disruptions. At this point, we do not see financial disruptions. We also um, have to think about the risks of this large balance sheet that we've created. I, I answered some questions regarding the fact that we don't see that as a risk now. We do think that we will be able to unwind that balance sheet in an orderly manner. And then um, there are just financial stability costs. You know, are we creating, as you're saying, um, inequities or uh, in, in the financial markets? And right now, we've determined that those potential costs and risks do not outweigh the benefits, that the benefits to a stronger economy are outweighing those costs. But it is important, and we stay, state in our statement, it is always important to balance the costs and benefits and to keep those potential costs in our view. Thank you. Hi, my name is Evan Hoffman from Old Dominion University. And um, a few weeks ago, I had the chance to listen to Doug Elmendorf from the Congressional Budget Office um, speak. And one of his points was that um, uh, the natural rate of unemployment have, has actually permanently risen from 5% to 6%. I was wondering what your opinion okay. is on that and how that would affect changes in monetary policy reactions. Okay. The, um, it's interesting that, that you point to that natural, that, that Doug's um, natural rate of unemployment is 6%, because that's actually my, uh, uh, my staff's opinion of where the natural rate is. But that's not, that's not uh, shared uh, widely, um, even within our committee, the FOMC. When I mentioned in my comments that we share quarterly our projections for economic growth, unemployment, and inflation. We also, in those projections, and we do them for usually a two-year period, but we also, and, and they are available on the Federal Reserve Board's web shot, website, frb.org, and uh, .gov, frb.gov, and you, and you can see in addition to those, the, the next couple of years in terms of our um, forecast, you, there's also a column that says longer term. And when you look at the unemployment rate, the range of the FOMC's members longer term for the unemployment rate is essentially what we're viewing as the natural rate of unemployment. 
And right now, that range is 5.2 percent to 6 percent. So I'm at the upper end of that range. So some of my colleagues think that the natural rate of unemployment is as low as 5.2 percent. And the implications for that in terms of monetary policy is that when the theory, economic theory shows that when you reach your natural rate of unemployment, if then that's the point where the con there's no longer any slack in the labor markets, and that's when you will start to see pressure on wages, and that pressure on wages could influence, put pressure on inflation. But so there's a wide that you know 5.2 percent to 6 percent is a pretty wide range in terms of what people think is the natural rate. But with our unemployment rate at 6.7 percent, we're that's above this range. So that means that unemployment is still elevated. It's closer to my 6 percent uh, level for unemployment but very far away from those who believe the natural rate is at 5.2 percent. Back to this side, I think. Uh, my name is Devin Rogers. I'm from the University of Portland. And in response to the topic of quantitative easing, I was curious to know uh, and just believe that there's an efficient market and it's well received uh, that the policies are coming uh, to. What would you say if the uh, quantitative, quantitative easing was not well received further in the future. What would the operations be for the Federal Reserve uh, in pertaining to that subject? I, I didn't hear the last part of the question. Uh, in, in terms of if the uh, market is inefficient and the quantitative easing is not technically well received, what would the operations of the Federal Reserve be in response to that? Okay. Well, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, the quantitative easing program, our purchase of, of these larger, um, longer-term assets, uh, will eventually end as the economy, um, as the economy and the and the outlook for the economy improves. After that program ends, as I mentioned in my comments. Uh, we will continue to provide an accommodative monetary policy by keeping the federal funds rate low uh, until, and we'll be watching the, um, again, labor market conditions, the, um, the, the strength of the recovery, how inflation unfolds to determine how long we'll keep that federal funds rate low. And that will also determine the pace of increase once we start to um, lift off. It's been called the lift off of the federal funds rate. You know, how we move interest rates after we begin lift off will also be determined by the pace of economic growth, by the unemployment rate, and by the inflation rate. So once QE ends, we'll go back to our, using more of our traditional tools. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Austin Bailey and I'm from Bellarmine University and I just had a follow-up question to his. With the, uh, the natural rate of unemployment, do you believe that we're moving more toward a European type of, I, 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 forgive me, but a, a more, torpo, more toward a European view of the system rather than the American view that we have now or do you feel that, I, I'm just curious on your opinion on this. And you know the question is when you mentioned a European view, um, I think that, that you're referring to the fact that Europe, um, after its deep recession and over the past decade or so, had high unemployment and it remained high. That they did not get back to their low levels, and there's some that believe that Europe will not get back to the low levels of unemployment. I do not believe that the U.S., uh, that that's the case for the U.S. There's been a lot of discussion over these past few years about whether the unemployment problem that we have today is cyclical or structural. If you think it's structural, then you're in the camp that says, we're not going to get back to the natural rate, that unemployment in the U.S. will stay elevated. 
that people who are looking for jobs don't have the right skills and will never find jobs. If you believe it's cyclical, then you believe as the economy strengthens, then more jobs, there'll be more demands for goods and services, more people will need to be hired to produce those goods and services, and the unemployment rate will go back to its natural level. The research that we've done at our bank shows that most of the unemployment that we have today is cyclical. That with more economic growth, with a stronger economy, people will find jobs. We also have in the United States a very flexible and a very dynamic workforce, unlike Europe. We have fewer regulations and labor laws around, um, around which makes our workforce and our labor markets much more flexible. Um, you know, having said that, uh, we do have to, another message uh, that's so important is that in our country, we do have to focus on continuing to grow and improve the skills of our workforce. Our staff at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland did some research that showed, that looked at the 50 states over a 75-year period. And in those 75 years, the top two factors that drive income growth economic growth in the state have never changed. They have always been the skill level of the workforce measured by educational attainment and innovation measured by the number of patents per capita in a state. Those states, those regions, and I will add those countries that have the most highly educated and skilled workforce and that are innovative will be those states, countries, and regions that have the highest economic growth. So the message for us, if we're going to improve this employment situation, we have to make sure that we have the appropriate training, education for our workforce, and we have to remain innovative. The United States is still the number one country in the world in terms of innovation. We have to maintain that position because it is that innovation that is going, and that education that's going to drive our economic growth and improve our standard of living in the future. And um, so I am confident that the labor markets will continue to improve, but we have to make sure that we continue to educate our workforce and that we continue to be a very innovative economy. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. The side. Hi, <coughs> Pian Alto. I'd like to first thank you for coming out and donating your time to us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is William Gross from Oakland University. My question is, everybody's speaking about quantitative easing, taking out of the, getting out of the market. I'm just curious, what are you guys' plans for Fannie and Freddie Mac to kind of taper off of them? Mm -hmm in the housing market? That's what I'm really curious to learn about. Well, unfortunately, this is the last question, and it's a question that I can't respond to, uh, because uh, it's Congress that's going to determine uh, what Freddie and, and, and Fannie, uh, what they're going to be look like, what they're going to be structured. And uh, you know, when I talked a little bit about the history of the central bank, the Federal Reserve System, we are an independent central bank. And um, Congress can take that independence away from us at any time. So the kind of agreement we have is we'll stay out of their work as long as, and, and they'll let us continue to do our work in an independent fashion. So, um, you know, we'll watch. I know there's a lot of, of, um, of interest. Uh, part of what got us into the financial crisis was the housing situation and uh, making, uh, fixing uh, Fannie and Freddie and, and how they're structured and the role that they will play is important. And you know, Congress will be deciding that, um, I believe, shortly. But thank you. Thank you for being here. It's great to have you. Your questions have been wonderful, well-informed, 
And again, that gives me a lot of confidence for the future of our financial markets in the United States, but our economy in general. So thank you very, very much for your good questions and for being here. Thank you. President, President Pimalto, one, more, one moment, one moment. Thank you very much for your knowledge and leadership insights, but we have one more presentation we have for you. An official Sweet 16 t-shirt. Thank you. Very good. I said I would, I, I didn't have a mic, I said I would wear this proudly. I'm, I'm very excited about this tournament, so thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.